nuclear and chemical weapons, then pulling in the range, you, don't, you have less options. We have been irresponsible. We sold arms to Iraq and trained them in how to use them. We sold arms to Iran and trained them how to use them. It was not Iraq that brought the first nuclear and chemical weapons into the Middle East, it was Israel. The countries over there are fighting and these engines and weapons are deadly and dangerous. And here comes someone that, that some people like less who's doing what others have done before. We've got thousands of thermonuclear weapons over there ourselves. We think he's evil, a lot of them think we're evil. We're not setting a very good example. One thing we could do would be to pull back. Now, is this a viable alternative or is this some Looney Tune peacenik saying, you know, not go to war against Saddam Hussein? Let me point out that in November, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Schwarzkopf, the commander of the troops in the Persian Gulf, two former chairmen of the Joint Chiefs, and a four-star Navy Admiral testified openly and firmly to the Congress that it would be a mistake to go to war against Saddam Hussein at least now. They said we should wait a year or two to see if we could not find some way uh, to work sanctions on the man to back him out of, out of what he had done in Kuwait. Uh, instead, for political reasons, George Bush overrode this advice of top military commanders and proceeded with his war. Now, Henry B. Gonzalez has that bill in there. Bush did get permission from the Congress to use force to enforce the United Nations resolution, but they are, are uh, promoting a bill, obviously it will not pass, uh, to prosecute him, to impeach him for inciting the nation into war. If we want to clean this mess up, we have to go to, the, to all the real perpetrators of the incendiary situation that we've got and, and punish them and prosecute them and hold them responsible and then we might have some chance of creating a situation in the Middle East where there could be peace. Now Israel's position right now is very understandable. They are being, uh, they are living under the threat of Scud missiles, any one of which could have chemical weapons on it. And this is not a pleasant thing, and when countries are in the position of being shelved like that, they tend to want to go and shoot back. Uh, Israel has its own agenda, and I am very critical of some of Israel's policies, but since my position is that we should resist war in the Persian Gulf, I applaud Israel for not, in fact, plunging into the war as they might very well have as they were tempted to do so. Now, however, I think that Israel is, is, and these are very intelligent people living in a very, you know, on a thin ice kind of situation in the Middle East in Israel, uh, I've seen no indication that they are really evaluating the long-term outcome of their policies. They are, they are vigorously supporting this effort to suppress uh, Saddam Hussein and get him killed, but it doesn't look to me like they're looking at the consequences in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, and the anger and the rage that's being bottled up right now, it's guaranteeing that we will have more wars sooner or later involving Israel in, in, in great violence. And there are other countries who do have chemical weapons there, and if this thing blows, Israel can nuke them and they can dump the chemical weapons on Israel, and it's going to be very ugly in the Middle East in the 25 years to come because of the violence that's being uh, generated there right now. Yes? Um, the media has been saying that the peace movement, like all the rallies, the anti-war rallies, are getting fewer and fewer people, and most of the people are for the war. What can the movement do as a whole to wake the people up and get people to shift their opinion? Is the peace movement doing the right thing, or should they change their tactics? I think the peace movement is by and large doing the right thing. That is this question. Uh, or should it change its tactics? Uh, I think it's a measure of the success, as I said before, of the establishment, the military establishment, in creating a good war that the peace movement would be wearing yellow ribbons along with the police in, in uh, Santa Cruz, for example, in, in sending support and warmth and cookies to the troops, i.e., the Vietnam War was stopped by the people in this country rising up in a great rage and anger. 
the peace movement is, is as, as Richard Maysur, the actor, uh, said when I was talking in L.A. the other day, and he stood up and he, he was arguing against me on this thing, and finally he said, well, John, because he had been a vigorous activist in the Vietnam War, against the Vietnam War, and he said, John, I want to feel good about this one. And well, I'm sorry, yes, the peace movement wants to feel good. It's in the instincts of people who want peace that they don't want to feel rage and anger. But I'm sorry, I don't see anything good about this war. There's nothing about it that makes me feel good. Nothing. And there is not as much energy coming from the peace movement as there might be. There's a crippling effect because this is such a good war that there seems to be something that will buy off uh, everybody, uh, you know, or a lot of people at different levels in this thing. They don't realize what is at stake. I have a friend in a different country uh, who has been uh, sending me books for years. Uh, he sent me the book called Friendly Fascism. He's a harsh critic of the U.S. and the U.S. military machine. But when this war was launched, uh, and we're talking about it over the phone, he says, I'm going to have to take a pass on this one uh, because I'm going to support Israel, whatever happens. So he's against war and he's against the U.S. war complex and everything unless Israel is involved. That's you know, what has brought him into this war. So on this one, he's taken a powder, he's put all of his books back in the other room, and he's going to support this war while still condemning the U.S. And once this war is over, he'll go back to blasting us. Uh, there is not a thread of constancy, it seems to me, in his vision of what's happening to the world. And there are other angles that are buying other people out you know, in different ways and into this war. I understand those drives and those prerogatives, but we're paying a hell of a price because we've restored war, we've restored the military machine, and the world will pay the price for it in the end. Yes, ma'am? You said earlier that there are countries that have always been able to find peaceful solutions. I wonder if you could give me a couple examples of how they've been able to find peaceful solutions. Because there's been so many Well, the question is examples of countries that have always or generally uh, tended to, to avoid going to war. A uh, famous one of those is, of course, Switzerland, which has set itself up in the great wars in Europe uh, as a broker nation, which they all agreed they would allow it to be neutral. Other countries that wanted to be neutral weren't given that luxury, sometimes were forced into it. Uh, Switzerland, of course, does uh, merciless economic exploitation of other countries, uh, so you can criticize Switzerland at that level. Uh, I would really want to, I've been there and I've talked to peace activists in Switzerland and conferred with them, including some famous women peace activists, but I really would hesitate without some thought or a little research to comment on the status of women in Switzerland, for example, as compared to here. It is, it, it, they cannot vote, someone told them. Yeah, this is the, the details that, uh, that I, like I say, I want to get into to be specific about Switzerland, but I will, I think your question is leading into what I consider to be an extremely important point. I have always been a feminist, despite also being a chauvinist in a lot of ways, but uh, my, my father taught my brother and I, when we were very small, to mend our own trousers because my mother had her very demanding career and it was his policy to support her very sincerely, and we all washed dishes, we all cleaned house, we all mended clothes, so that he could do his job and she could do hers and all of that. Profound feminist in terms of equal rights and all of that. Uh, I observe and watch what's happening in the world. I've said many times early on in my own growth that, that perhaps the answer, since men have so bungled uh, the world and gotten it into the jam that it's in now, perhaps the answer would be to go in the direction of women's leadership. However, <laughs> however, with that thought, you immediately run into problems. The three great women leaders of modern times uh, took their countries into war. Mar Margaret Thatcher, uh, Indira Gandhi, and Golda Meir. Now, of course, Okay, let me finish. Of course, the feminists will stand up and say, but they were forced to play it by the men's rules. However, let me point out some thoughts to you. Uh, 
Phil Donahue did a show in 1985, five-part segment, The Human Animal, one of which was on aggression, and he had these neurologists from UCLA who went on and gave the statistics that men seek violent solutions ten times as often as women. Women will resort to bloody violence a tenth as often as men. And I thought about this, and I wrote him a letter, and I said, I think you missed something in those professors, because when you're talking about war, yes, on the streets or in a house, a woman is a tenth as likely to pick up a knife and stab. Uh, women can do it, and they do it, but a tenth as often as men. But when you get into war, you're talking about a different dynamic. Margaret Thatcher was not picking up a machine gun and shooting people down in blood. She was organizing her giant family. And for lots of centuries, women have been very capable of mobilizing the family, protecting the family, fighting for the turf, arguing, and even physically resisting people who are encroaching on her family. She was managing something and orchestrating something very capably. She was not going to war herself. Now, it is true that men suffer from testosterone poisoning. <laughs> this, this is... This is the hormone of violence. It relates to violence. There's no question about that. That's true. Uh, it is actually generated by certain types of physical activity. And in the schools, for example, where you have big football teams where everyone supports them and they get a lot of support and their testosterone is high, there are a lot more crimes of violence against women by football players then, for example, in colleges where you have a football team where the team is de-emphasized and doesn't have the support. This is the testosterone factor and the testosterone factor at its worst. I came up with a theory for whatever it's worth, and you can all scream and throw things at me if you will, but it seems to me, I watch women going through training in Marine Corps boot camp and screaming and yelling the same insane songs. Uh, that What was that song that they were singing in the, uh, the women's... Uh, training uh, uh, something about uh, a bird fl fl flew in through my window th on the sill and I killed it. I'm a le lean, mean Marine. Uh, the same insane mad soldier songs that the men were singing, and it didn't take much to get them to want to join. Pat Schroeder, who's been out there in Nevada with us protesting the nuclear arms race in the Persian Gulf War, was giving speeches uh, inside the Congress saying that women must have the same rights to combat that the men do, defending the rights to be killers. Uh, it seems to me that what we're dealing with, this may be an inane idea, is that we're all 85% people and we're all 15% men and women. There's a big common denominator in us with regarding wars and violence and the ability to kill and fly planes and strafe and bomb and rationalize violence. Certainly women sure are taking to it in the Gulf with great patriotism and gusto. And there's a 15% factor that is different, and I applaud the difference. And there is in that factor somewhere nurturing, and this is where I come on real strong. If we turn to some source or engine in the world for help, it's not going to be to all women, because some, some women will be perfectly happy to lead us to war and fly the planes that drop the nuclear weapons. It's got to be to find and isolate that 15% maternal nurturing instinct and somehow use it to develop the principle of nurturing our planet and our resources and humankind. Yes, ma'am. Yes, this, this question is discussing what's going to happen to the, to the U.S. and to the world as the middle class continues to shrink, the poor continue to grow percentile in, in the society, 
and they're, they are called upon to support and fight the war as the wealth is shifted to the top. The danger, if we don't reverse this policy, of course, is continuing polarization that was set in motion under the leadership of Ronald Reagan and George Bush till eventually, in the polarization, there is a great uh, gulf between us and then conflict, and then they apply the controls of the FEMA and the world passes into a very harsh and nasty world order. That is the direction in which we are, we are going if we don't reverse it. Somehow we have to find the leadership and the energy amongst ourselves to create a party that will vote people into office, that will begin repealing these laws, that will begin reversing the flow, that will redistribute the wealth a little bit and bring the people closer together so it won't polarize into a very nasty uh, uh, conf conflict, confrontation that in fact is evolving very rapidly right in front of our eyes. Yes, sir, in the tie. The question is, is this Persian Gulf War a genocide? Are we deliberately targeting civilian targets? Uh, yes, I would definitely call it a genocide to the extent which gen uh, civilians are being killed. I really deplore this war. The first victims, I said, were the Kuwaitis who were invaded, raped, pillaged, and now are living on the battlefield. And the second victims are the Iraqi people uh, who, who, have been, who are now underneath the bombs. There are lots of people being killed by these bombs. The military is working very hard to give us the impression that they're trying to target military targets and then they're being candid and saying nevertheless there will be civilians hit. I have not seen evidence of deliberate targeting large numbers of civilians just to be killing large numbers of civilians. Uh, we don't know. That would be bad politics. But we simply don't know. They certainly are careless. Certainly in Panama, <clears throat> when they were going in after Noriega, they managed to kill 2,000 people as we invaded that tiny little country. They were not careful in bombing and strafing to keep it out of civilian areas. I believe that in time when the truth is known, if the media will report it, eventually we got the figures on Panama from 60 Minutes. If the media will report it, I think we're going to find that a lot more civilians were killed than our smiling, serious, sober, uh, articulate, military spokesfolks are telling us right now. I'm truly concerned about that. Yes? Uh, the question is about uh, CI manipulation, the installation of military governments in Brazil and Chile in the 60s and 70s, and now that democracy has been restored, uh, how effectively has it been restored? And uh, it, there, there, is, there is considerable uh, excitement in Chile now uh, of the fact that they do have a functioning democracy. The death squad activity is still taking place, but in a very small level. People can speak out, they can promote bills, they can champion things, and not really worry about being disappeared the way that, that 30 or 40,000 of them were after we installed uh, Pinochet into office. I have the impression that the system is working pretty good and the Chilean people are, are a lot happier about it. Pinochet is still there, he and his goons are unpunished, and this is obviously a threat and something of concern. My, my grown daughter is engaged to a Chilean, and I've talked to him about these things, uh, an educated man from the universities there who lived through that horror, and uh, his morale is up. He is cynical about the corruption that still exists. It's not as bad as it was before. 
Yes, sir, in the back. The question is, how important do I feel the CIA's role was in the downfall, destabilization, the, the explosion, implosion of the Soviet Union that is happening today? And uh, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a tough question. We haven't had any great uh, exposés of the programs. We do know that the CIA has been interested in encouraging this process. It clearly benefits the United States to see the other superpower broken down. The other side of that is there is a tendency to overrate the power of the CIA. Now, on the one hand, I lecture and try to expose all of the, the activities it's done to destabilize the world, to make so many people suffer. On the other hand, the problems that the Soviet Union has uh, we're 70 years in the making, an economy, and before that, an economy uh, that has been repressed, a people that have been repressed, the, the major energy of that society in greater proportion siphoned off into the military. It came into the arms race from World War II. If you read Daniel Jurgen's book, Shattered Peace, uh, the Soviet Union really on its knees at the end of World War II. We were soaring. It was not a fair competition if we were competing with them. They had lost... I forget the figures, 20 million. Uh, 20 million people killed, there were 70,000 villages had been raised, they had lost 500,000 railroad cars, for example, the industrial base shattered as the armies had fought over it, uh, cities had been under siege for several long years with incredible disease and suffering and repression, tremendous traumatic scar on the country, and they were picking themselves up from that with the motto of never again, i.e. they would build up, they'd been invaded four times in history by major armies from Europe coming down and sweeping across, and they just said never again. So they set out to pay any price to develop an army and a nuclear capability that nobody could invade them with impunity in the future. The result was that the Soviet people paid a tremendous price. I mean, safe ways, forget it. To, to buy a pot roast, if you're having someone to dinner, you, you know, you, and this is before the recent collapse where the conditions are so bad now. When I visited in 85, you would have to stand in line for hours if there was a pot roast there for you to buy when you got there. Tremendous sacrifice by the people to support a very essentially corrupt military industrial uh, machinery. To reverse that, just to wave a wand over it and say, you're now free and capitalism will prevail and we will prosper, it just doesn't work that way. There's a sense, I talk to people, of course, I have access to, I talk to famous economists and people around about it, people are writing books on it. One of them told me that the Soviet Union, the people, had been sold a kind of a bill of goods that, that capitalism and profits were a magic word. And he said it reminded him, he said he'd written a paper, he'd quoted Woody Allen, who had said he had been forced to study violin all his life, and he finally gave it up when he was in his teens, when he realized he didn't know which end to blow on. <laughs> I mean, you have a system where they declared freedom of the press, but one government agency controlled all the paper and ink. And then, very quickly, as things got tight, Gorbachev said, you know, we have an open society, we have a president, and then he pulled on to the presidency dictatorial powers that George Bush would dream of. And, and then the KGB has now been restored to full strength and the military, and they've withdrawn the freedom of the press. And the reason that they're getting so tough is they cannot give to the Soviet people the goods and freedoms that the Soviet people expected Glasnost and Perestroika would, would bring. The CIA didn't do all of this to the Soviet Union. I'm sure they're in there when they can, you know, gigging a little bit here and there uh, to urge people along into the fragmentation of the thing. They probably have representatives in Lithuania and Latvia, for example, uh, nudging the process along, but I doubt if they're really big players in that giant dynamic of what's happening there. Back to this side. Yes, sir. Uh, to take the last question first, no, I'm not a Marxist. Uh, I've struggled for a long time to try to figure out what I am since I left the agency. I can't find a label that fits. I'm certainly not a capitalist. I don't have any capital. 
Uh, I was talking to a Welsh filmmaker who took me to Havana to try to do a film about the Cubans in Africa when that was an issue in 1978. We were talking about this and he said, he said, you're talking about the good people of the world. My basic philosophy that I worked out in college when frankly I found that Christianity as I had been taught had some flaws <laughs> because I was taught that everybody who didn't agree with me was going to burn in hell's fires for all of eternity and that seemed a little harsh. And uh, so I came out with my own philosophy, which I would probably describe as humanism. Some people say neo-humanism, and I get confused real easy. I just call it humanism. People have to be at the bottom, and their interests and right and the broadest health of as many people as we possibly can has to be the driving force and key principle of any system that I will really commit my soul to. Yes. And the, oh. Yeah, South Africa, of course, has maintained close ties with the United States Economic White South Africa and Israel. They've been working at an accommodation and modifying the apartheid laws. There's some. There's obviously deep, monstrous uh, problems living in Africa. The 15 years that I did and working there with the CIA and visiting South Africa. I'm, keenly aware of those problems. Uh, and the CIA, by the way, has a long time historic commitment to the white South African security services. They, they are making progress. They have released Nelson Mandela from prison. They are repealing some of the laws. And I do applaud, but I think that the move now to repeal the sanctions is premature. I think that that would be unfortunate for them to leap to do that until you really do achieve one person, one vote in the country and come up with some kind of a leveling effect. It would seem to me that the new world order is not going to have as a fundamental principle the people of any country, including the people of South Africa. I just cannot see George Bush getting real worked up about the, the plight uh, and inequities of the lives of blacks in South Africa when he is so insensitive to the lives of the poor in this own country. Yes, in the red in the back. The question is government, uh, FBI, CIA, surveillance of student leaders, comment, uh, what you would have to do to attract uh, such uh, hostile surveillance or interest. Uh, I would say that if you're 20 years old and you do not have four files on you in some government offices, you're not a responsible citizen of the world. <laughs> The fascist instincts, the control instincts of the police, their rationales. Now, mind you, I would not want to live in a society that had no police. It's in the nature of human beings that people would get very ugly and abusive, and it would be a very difficult place to live in. And I would have to go around carrying a weapon like Bo Greitz does, and I don't think I'm as good a shot as I used to be, and I'd rather not have to do all of that. I'd rather live in a country that you had a police. The trouble is policing the police and getting, keeping them from getting selective ideas that they have the right to persecute, for example, as the FBI did the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, and the Deep South finding the FBI participating in the establishment of 50 KKK chapters. For example, finding out that the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, was a compulsive gambler gambling every weekend and two vacations a year in mob casinos and losing money and coincidentally having a policy of not uh, prosecuting or persecuting the mob. He said they were not a problem in our society. Of uh, finding out that this man who dominated our national uh, police organization for so many years was uh, was homosexual, which of course is his business. He had a live-in lover for, for a couple of three decades, but he viciously destroyed the lives of other homosexuals. And there you get into someone who's twisted. 
Now this, you get the heritage of that organization that he created, and it is out there with a policy that is known. It feels it has the obligation and the right to penetrate student groups and build files, and they're, they're quite energetic. They're not as pervasive as you might think. They just don't have the budget. They can't have two million people working for them, but they go in and they recruit someone in groups and say, go around and tell us what these people are doing and take photographs. And it's just very simply, as I said, if you are active at all, uh, you're going to be in their files. I would be very embarrassed if I found I was not in their files. <laughs> it would really mean... Now, this is scary, but I have urged people before to go home tonight and take out your dictionary and erase the words safe and secure. Just scratch them out altogether. Those words do not pertain to a world that's polluted with 60,000 thermonuclear weapons and controlled by people with the objectives that these people now have on this world and what we're doing to the environment of this world. There is no safe and there is no secure. Don't pretend there is. This is what Helen Caldicott means you'll feel better if you get to work on the problem because there is nowhere to hide. The planet's too small now. The only solution, and it's a tough one, we are heading towards an extinctive situation for warm-blooded life unless we change and there's nowhere to hide. Yes, the, the other one in the red. Uh, just very, yeah, very basically, uh, in Angola, the CIA is continuing the activities to destabilize the country that I myself helped to set in motion in 1975. Arming Jonas Savimbi, I was the one that flew in and recruited him into our program uh, in 1975 and put him on our payroll. Uh, for a while, the Clark Amendment had it suspended what we were doing, and the South Africans were doing it for us. And then President Reagan repealed the Clark Amendment. And now, since 1987, I think it was, uh, we've been back in there legally, giving him arms, giving him missiles with which he shoots down passenger planes and admits that he does it. And uh, the, the result is continuing instability uh, in Angola. It, continuing suffering, continuing huge allocations of resources uh, into the destabilization of the country and the defense of the country, into the rebuilding of the country. It's a country that we have designated as a permanent, de permanent designated enemy. And until the government is overthrown or there is pressure from the public to release the country from this, this enemies list of ours, I think we will probably continue to brutalize it. The Soviet Union, as it's losing its resources and collapsing into economic chaos, has less resources to put in on the other side. However, Angola is an oil country and it's been buying most of the arms from the Soviet Union. And uh, my sense, we are, by the way, as you notice, drifting into Cold War II. And it's my concern that we will probably uh, find ourselves with the Soviets continuing to arm Angola and us continuing to destabilize it, barring a miracle for the Angolan people. I feel very sorry for, sorry for them and with a sense of personal involvement since I helped set that program in motion all those years ago. Yes, sir, there's a dark spot in there, but I can see a hand up. Yeah, this is a good and enormously timely question because George Bush was, uh, all of the signals were that they would bomb for another month or so. Uh, the Iraqi army in Kuwait. And then Saddam Hussein said himself, or there was a signal came out that they might withdraw from Kuwait under certain circumstances. And immediately George Bush moved up the date. <laughs> Instead of months, it would be a matter of days before we would engage the ground war because they want a violent solution. Then Gorbachev steps in and starts organizing a peace initiative. And it's not very mis mystifying why he's doing what he's doing. He has horrendous problems in the Soviet Union, which he cannot solve either. Uh, he has brought on himself dictatorial powers, and people are protesting, calling for his resignation. Countries are breaking away. 
the, the Soviet Union is threatening to descend into chaos with his armies or the central armies fighting uh, armies uh, in the different republics, civil wars and chaos and secessions. He desperately needed something to give himself some energy and so taram, he steps out as the peace negotiator of the Persian Gulf War. What they're going to get out of it in addition to his distracting the world uh, and the Soviet Union from the problems, if, if he succeeds, is keeping their client state, Iraq has had long ties with the Soviet Union, alive, keeping it from being invaded and overrun and broken by the United States. Winning the friendship of the Arab world that the United States has now bitterly antagonized. Unfortunately, this is going to lead to Cold War II, where they are on one side and we are on another in an inflamed situation in North Africa and the Middle East. You notice this has been very frustrating to the White House and the Bush administration, because, on, and they've been open about it. It would look very bad if they launched this ground war and we started taking body bags while there was a serious peace proposal on the table. They want a violent solution, but on the other hand, they're under enormous pressure from the, the people in the coalition and other countries in the United Nations and the world order that he's brought together to accept some kind of a compromise that will uh, save all of the massacre in the desert. So what George Bush has done is said he would give Saddam Hussein until tomorrow at noon to totally capitulate and promise total withdrawal and begin the withdrawal with no strings attached or we will launch the ground war. And I personally am sitting here holding my breath hoping that, uh, that the pressure on George Bush uh, will force him to moderate his position and that Saddam Hussein will back out. What Saddam Hussein has to get out of this, by the way, is if he is permitted to withdraw his army intact, then he will, be, he will have an army back in Iraq with all the damage done to society, and he will be a major player still in the Middle East. George Bush's interest is that he has this army cut off in the desert, he can destroy it. It won't wipe out the, National, the Republican Guard, but it will wipe out about half of Iraqi's forces and tanks and artillery and all of that. So he has a strong case uh, for wanting to cut them off, isolate them, and also he wants to blood the United States. Getting us worked up to war, this is not a man by nature, nor, nor is it in his interest just to neck in the back seat of a car. He needs to consummate the thing with a violence and blood the United States and grieve the loss of some soldiers in order for us to be truly restored as a warring nation. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a question about Israel's role in this war. I've referred to it obliquely, uh, and I hasten to say that I am not, it is not my forte, the study of the Middle East. I'm an Africanist in Asia. I studied Central America in the 80s. I've begun in the last eight months to read into the Middle East. I have been there before, since I was eight years old, a few times, uh, but I would not be qualified to really speak for all the subtleties of Israel's position and I can guarantee you that anything I say will piss someone off. That just goes with discussing Israel in the Middle East. Uh, I, would, uh, I would say, uh, quite obviously, just an observation, Israel has for a long time since it was formed worked very hard and very successfully to create a lobbying group for its interest in the United States and it has been very successful. This is one of the strongest lobbying groups in the United States. There is nothing outrageous or unfair about this. Everybody is trying to lobby for their interests in this country. Uh, they've just perhaps been more successful. So the United States has given Israel a lot of aid. It has helped Israel create a force, an army, which it feels, quite frankly, will tend to do what it calls stabilizing and representing a certain aspect of, of its interests in the Middle East, but Israel is not in a position to represent all of the U.S. interests in the Middle East. We have interests in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, for example, where they're investing billions of dollars in our economy, not in their own countries, but in our economy of the oil money, 
and uh, selling, therefore having to sell them military equipment and things that uh, makes Israel uncomfortable. So there's definitely a tension between the two countries, a tension between Ronald Reagan and Israel, a tension between George Bush and Israel. It's, it's his great pride of accomplishment in the New World Order and the coalition is that he brought together certain Arab states and other Middle Eastern states, including Israel, into one coalition and held them together through a month of violence. Uh, to get deeper into that subject, we should get someone up here who's, who is much more of a scholar of Israel, if you will permit me. I want to take one more question, the young lady in white, and then I'll get back to this side, coming through the middle. George Bush's involvement in the Iran-Contra scandal uh, is pretty well known, actually. He was the most active, perhaps, vice president we've ever had. He had connections and contacts from his CIA days. He had his son down in Florida. He had personal contacts with people in the, in the Cuban exile movement and then people in the Contra infrastructure. Uh, I can give you two, three specific examples, for example, uh, of the energy that he had in the Contra program when the CIA itself was balking the pros in the CIA were refusing to work in this thing because they saw it as illegal and sick and would get them in trouble. And William Casey was wiring around with, with Oliver North and with George Bush, you know, running wires around the central engine of control in the thing. Now, uh, three examples come to mind. Four, we know he flew down to confer with Manuel Noriega in about 1983. He was involved in trying to set up the Black Eagle resupply thing to the country from the south, which Noriega eventually balked on. We know that he had uh, direct contact communications from Felix Rodriguez, who was placed in Ilopango in El Salvador, flying planes against the Salvadorian rebels, but also supervising the airflow, the air wing of arms from the U.S. to the Contras in Honduras and Nicaragua. Uh, Rodriguez's history goes back into Vietnam when he was with Don Gregg, who went on to work with Bush in China, and then became Vice President Bush's National Security Advisor. Felix Rodriguez was, re was reporting directly to Don Gregg about the management of the Contra program. We know this because they were outside of the CIA and they were using essentially commercial communications and we got the public telephone bills and he was calling Don Gregg every day for advice when Hassenfuss, his plane was shot down. The first U.S. official who was notified of it was a phone call to George Bush's office to tell him what had happened. We know that Felix Rodriguez received uh, money from the Medellin Co Colombian cocaine cartel to fund the Contra operations, buying access to the airplanes so the airplanes would fly drugs back into the United States. According to the drug launderer Milian Rodriguez, $10 million, to his knowledge, were funneled through uh, Felix Rodriguez into the Contra program. We also know that they got Luis Posada Carillas out of prison in Venezuela because, as Felix said, we needed him. And this is the man who was responsible for uh, blowing, helping to blow up the passenger plane taking off from Barbados on October 26th of 1976, killing 73 passengers on board. A terrorist, an airplane bomber, who was got out to work for Felix Rodriguez in the program that was being supervised from George Bush's vice president's office directly. We know that Barry Seals, when he was caught smuggling drugs, flew up to Washington to confer with the vice president's office to cut a deal that if he would do activities and run errands for the drug smugglers, uh, uh, for the CIA against, uh, that he would, uh, he would not be prosecuted, he could cut a deal and one of the things he did was to land a plane in Panama and, and they would kick some bales of marijuana off it onto the runway to be photographed by satellite and Ronald Reagan was able to show these pictures to the public claiming that they were in Nicaragua, claiming to prove that the Sandinistas were smuggling drugs, which they were not. Now, how bad was Bush's involvement by the Iran-Contra scandal broke in late October, early no November of 1986. In the winter of 87 and through into the winter of 88, conservative columnists were writing that George Bush's political career was over because of his involvement in the Iran-Contra scandal. 
They knew what had happened and they said this man cannot survive, i.e. to keep the Reagan revolution going and their gains, they were going to sacrifice him because he was too dirty. And you can go back if you like, it's a fun project, go down and go through the films in the library and just flip through them and read the columns and you'll find them in there in the winter of 88, during the year of 87. Then to their surprise, in the spring, uh, they began to see he would not resign and I was saying in my lectures then that if he failed to achieve the presidency, he would probably go to jail. If he didn't pull onto himself the protection of the presidency, probably the dirt would come out and he would be prosecuted. But that's moot because he did succeed in capturing the Republican nomination. Once it began to look like the public would buy him, then the establishment got onto his bandwagon and began to promote him and then the energy mounted and he went whirling into the presidency uh, with, with uh, Dan Quayle following him around to fulfill the role of making him look tall and articulate. Uh, let's, let's take, it is late and we have to close the building and my voice is breaking. Let's take three more questions and then we're just going to have to go. You've been trying very hard, sir. Yeah, this one is a really big, important subject. Oliver Stone is making a movie about it right now in Dallas. I have the great privilege to have a very small part in his production of this film. Uh, he's also bought Jim Garrison's uh, book on the subject and he's very close to Jim Garrison and it's a quite moving story. The last time I talked to him, they had Kevin Costner to star in it, although they haven't announced that and I don't know if that's true or if it's a rumor. Uh, they are putting together uh, what should be with his magic touch a uh, very powerful recreation of what happened uh, and we would, you know, obviously we would need three hours to go through the whole thing. I have tried to read up on it. The best book on the subject that we have out now, right now, I wouldn't say it's perfect but it's the best is Crossfire by Jim Mars summarizing. Uh, in a nutshell, there is not any possibility that there was a lone assassin. Lee Harvey Oswald was not on the sixth floor of the book depository when the president was killed. The rifle that they attributed to him did not do the killing. There was a plot to kill him. As, as Fletcher Prouty puts it, we know how to keep presidents alive in that case because so many people in the power structure wanted him dead, they withdrew the protection and let him be killed. Uh, it was a military ambush, there were three firing stations, and my, my military expertise, I would testify in court as, a, as an expert witness, I would say that there were at least 12 people involved in the, in the action itself. It was a military style ambush, I can show you that eight to ten shots were fired. Uh, there were two stations from behind and one from the front, carefully timed, carefully planned, and totally brass. Broad daylight, a military ambush. The cover-up went into effect immediately. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover obviously had some prior knowledge but because before the Dallas police could have identified Lee Harvey Oswald, he called Bobby Kennedy and gave him Lee Harvey Oswald's bio and said he was the killer. We know that the mob and others, uh, there were police reports that, that uh, in the mob and in some right-wing organizations in Florida that the president was going to be killed with a high-powered rifle and a patsy set up to take the fall. And this is exactly what happened. In my own estimation, and this gets into uh, less of an expert witness, but just my own reading and reconstruction of what happened, uh, a lot of people who read into this say renegades did it, but they were definitely associated with the CIA, the Mafia, and Cuban exiles. I think we can make a case that would definitely stand up in court if we could ever get this thing back into court to that effect. Uh, the renegades were CIA operatives who were working out of the JM Wave Station, running military activities into Cuba, and then they turned the guns on the President in the United States because of the collective rage against him. The question gets to be then, did the CIA high command have any prior knowledge? Did they plan it? Did they order it? Did they have a prior knowledge of it? Uh, I believe there are thin indications uh, that they, they did. 
but uh, there's not enough that you could cite it as solid evidence in court. My instincts, see they had created the ZR Rifle Assassination Unit under William Harvey, who hated the Kennedys, who had clashed with the Kennedys, and he was running, we have his handwritten project outline, because they didn't want a secretary to type it, setting up this assassination unit, saying it has to be, uh, criminals have to be recruited to run the activities, and case officers who are comfortable with criminal activities have to manage it. And this thing was set up, and he had, he had clashed with the Kennedys in a violent way over the Cuban Missile Crisis. While, it, God, this is so complex, it's hard just to assert it, but while the President Kennedy was trying to get the missiles out of Cuba and bluffing wor World War III, nuclear war with the Soviet Union, but wanting to resolve it, bluff the, you know, not wanting to go to war, William Harvey was jamming killer teams into Cuba to provoke the war, to provoke the fighting. And this was a pirate thing outside of policy by a madman down in the CIA's assassination unit. Afterwards, Bobby Kennedy found out what had happened and they broke Harvey and exiled him to the Rome station. And eventually he died of eating beef and steaks and drinking too much. But at the time, his rage against Kennedy and his propensity for killing and this unit's activity and then the threads and indications that we have, I would say somewhere from that group or the people that worked under him or with him, with Cuban exiles, with the mafia, and we have a lot of details of the overlapping activities with the mafia in this thing. They are the ones who actually put the shooters in Dallas and pull the triggers. Yes, sir, in the red. Well, uh, I'll, I'll give you some suggestions, and I don't mean these to be radical. In terms of specifics, you know, I don't know where you live and what your, your skills are and talents in that sense, whether you should join this type of a group or that. But uh, one thing, I, I, I had to teach myself to read these books. When I left the CIA, I'd been reading cables, but mostly running operations and reading fiction for fun. I had to teach my mind to read in order to master all of this stuff and come up with the, the, the observations that I come up with, uh, I would suggest that you go home and unplug your television set with a pair of scissors. It's, it's an enormous amount of fun when you're tired, it's addictive and you're being fed lots of illusions and fantasies and fun things that will distract you from reading and informing yourself. If there's a television around, you will not converse with people and share ideas and information and grow. Uh, there's always somewhere you can go to watch a tennis match or a football game if you want to as a special event, and you'll enjoy it more. You can get your news and information, and CNN is such a champion of the truth anyway, you can get it from other sources. Set yourself a habit of reading. Start with newspapers and journals. Share articles with people. Practice reading and then sharing the information with as many people as you can. Travel with when you can because it's enormously growthful to travel. Go to countries. Uh, I, I went, for example, in all of my different travels, I went to Vietnam to see what we'd done there. I went to England. Uh, to go out and spend the afternoon talking to the women at Greenham Commons, you know, that were doing their protest. I've tried to go everywhere I could on my limited resources. It's not easy, uh, but it's tremendously growthful, and you just feel a greater sense of the universe and the world when you sit down with concerned people in London or in Sweden or in, in Hanoi or in an island in the Caribbean or wherever. 
It's a tough one nevertheless, but the key has to be that kind of an approach reaching out broadly to people all the way across the world. It's the only way I see that we're going to be able to turn this thing back. Enough people deeply concerned. I had an interesting discussion, uh, and I don't mean to get uh, into to esoteric interpretations and everybody has different personalities, but I had a small clash with uh, uh, one of the security officers in the airport in San Luis Obispo. He didn't know me, it was nothing personal, but he was, he was following people around and you would try to buy, you know, get a cup of coffee over here and he would say you had to carry your suitcase over there and then carry it back because you shouldn't be separated from your suitcases. And then he got kind of outrageous and so I stood up to him and told him he was not doing his job properly and that there was no threat since I was here in you know, my suitcase. It was six in the morning and I was tired, but nevertheless. And then a gentleman got up and wanted to fight me. He threatened to, to hit me. I think he was martial arts or something because he was not very big. But he ordered me to apologize and threaten me. And so I stood literally nose touching nose with him, which is the way he put himself, telling him that he should back down, that it was my business and he was interfering. And if he wanted to miss his plane and me miss mine, you know, then we could spend the morning talking about this, but that he should sit down. Then I went over and sat down with this officer and talked to him about how to do his job of watching for security things without becoming a Nazi and abusing people and bullying people and disrupting their lives. Now, we were discussing this in Santa Cruz later, and a peace activist said, I'm a hard nose, you know, that I was being a source of friction. Uh, but I, I and, and Lord knows, I, I do not say that I'm, you know, I'm all wisdom or anything, but my thought is this. I disagree with the Bible on the point that you turn your other cheek when someone hits you, because I guarantee if a bully hits you and you turn your other cheek, he'll hit it too. And what I believe, I don't believe in hitting back, but I believe when someone hits you, you very firmly and reasonably tell them that it's wrong to hit, that they shouldn't hit, that they should find another way to do business, and if they do hit you a second time, you tell them again that that's not the proper conduct because it's clearly demonstrated throughout history that if you let people steamroll you, especially police, and they get the sense that they have the right to bully people and shove them around, they'll do it. If they get feedback and protest, vigorous, firm, sane, mature feedback, then they have to cope with it and they'll pull back. I think this kind of approach to the people in government, if we roll over and say it's inevitable, then they win by default. We have to stand up to them in every forum you can think of <laughs> and reason with them. Now, I'm sorry for the others, it's getting so late, but that, that the lady in white has been trying all night to speak and I'm dying to hear. Uh, only the question is about the state defense forces and the neo-Nazi camps that are springing up all over the country and do I have a comment and only the very obvious comment that this is very definitely uh, a manifestation of the the instincts and principles that uh, uh, President Reagan, Governor Reagan worked to inculcate. Bush a little bit less uh, petty and obnoxious about it, but uh, Ronald Reagan had a real affinity for such madness. And uh, these things are grassroots madness. This is a dangerous element. This is where you're taking the worst kind of people and they're being encouraged to get together and rehearse war, rehearse machine gunning people, rehearse imposing their will on people. I see it as a very dangerous thing, very much a symptom of the times, of what's happening of what we're heading into. Very much part of what all sane people have to uh, calmly, maturely, and determinedly put the brakes on. This could go on all night, but it can't go on all night. I've got to speak again in San Diego at noon tomorrow and get up at five to get there at the airport. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Is there someone can drive? Can we get out of here fairly quickly? Yeah. Uh, 